Welcome to Finding Immunity, the race for a vaccine at St. Louis University, hosted by the SLU Research Institute and SLU's Office of Alumni Engagement. This is the first part of a collaborative series between these two offices highlighting COVID-19 research at SLU. Today's session brings together an interdisciplinary panel of SLU researchers to discuss the effort to develop a vaccine and what comes next once we have that vaccine. My name is Dr. Terry Redman. I am Director of the Institute for Biosecurity, Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, and Special Assistant to the President. I want to begin today's conversation by giving just a very brief overview of things that are going on at SLU right now in regards to COVID-19. I'm not going to bore you with the details of all the public health safeguards that we have put into place in order to reopen our campus safely, but you can find a list of those on our website if you are interested in that. But so far, SLU's response to COVID-19 has been very strong. Our infection rates among both employees and students have been very low. Our positivity rate is 2.6%, which is far below what we're seeing in the St. Louis region um, regionally. We still have plenty of isolation and quarantine space on campus. We are not seeing widespread disease on campus at this time, which is great news. So we are definitely keeping an eye on what's happening um, in terms of our students and employee population. Last week, we did have um, a relatively large change in our approach to COVID-19 response, where we have started to add more large-scale asymptomatic testing. That involves conducting a 10% random sample um, of testing using a saliva test of our on-campus students, and we do that once a week. In addition, we are testing our athletics um, team members who are in season, that right now currently involves our basketball players. And then in addition, we are adding um, other testing if, as on an on-needed basis or as as-needed basis. So that's all I'm going, that's just my very, very brief introduction to what's happening at SLU. Um, so now um, that's going to bring us to today's conversation. We do want to hear from you as audience members. So we're going to have a Q&A portion near the end of the webinar. So please submit your questions through the questions tool on Zoom. So now to get started, we're going to start with our first panelist. And that is Dr. Dan Hoff, Director of the Center for Vaccine Development and Director of the Division of Infectious Diseases, Allergy and Immunology. Dr. Hoff is going to be sharing an update on the research happening at SLU on treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. But first, he's going to introduce a couple whose generosity has made that research possible. Dr. Hoff? You're on mute, Dr. Hoff. Thank you um, for uh, introducing me and for reminding me I was on mute. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, my first charge is to introduce uh, a new institute that's named after very generous uh, uh, donors uh, that are here with us today, called the Dr. Stephen C. Piper and uh, Z. Xuan Wong. Uh, Institute for Vaccine Science and Policy. I'll get better at that as I go along. It's a mouthful, but it's we're really excited about this new institute, which I will abbreviate as the IVSP, uh, because this gives us an opportunity to break down silos here at St. Louis University to uh, build new uh, collaborative research areas and to contribute in a broader way to the world um, in relationship to vaccine development and um, implementation. Uh, I will, the gift that given by Drs. Piper and Wong uh, is uh, uh, something that's a founding um, uh, donation for starting this institute. Uh, Dr. Piper was, uh, is, an, is an alumni of our School of Medicine that we're proud of, who has gone on to um, very uh, powerful things. He currently is the Peter Herbert Professor and Chair of Pathology, Anatomy, and Cell Biology at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College at Thomas Jefferson University. He has a long track record of doing outstanding research in areas, in multiple areas of immunology. Um, and we are honored that he has decided to give us this uh, founding uh, gift. 
And with that brief introduction, um, I would like uh, to actually reveal, if they can reveal themselves, <laughs> Drs. Piper and Wong, who are with us today. Um, and again, now that I can see you, thank you so very much uh, for your generosity. Um, and we hope to build on this uh, in many ways to hopefully make you proud of what we're doing. Thank you, Dan. So hi, my name is Steve Piper, and this is my wife, Zisha and Wong. And I graduated from the St. Louis University School of Medicine decades ago in 1977. As I've evolved into the golden years of my career, I increasingly have been reminded of the outstanding quality of my medical education and have looked for a way to express my gratitude to my alma mater. So I contacted Pat Dolan in the development office who introduced me to Dean Wilmot just before Christmas 2019. And as the COVID pandemic evolved, Dean Wilmot and I continued our discussions. Now, it's important to know some background information that several years ago, Dean Monteleon invited me informally to return to St. Louis University Medicine. And when I reviewed the ongoing research activities at that time, I found an outstanding program for vaccine development uh, under the direction of Dr. Robert Belchi. Since our research and my research on chemokine receptors strongly contributed to early work on the identification of the frontline co-receptor for commonly transmitted strains of HIV, this program really caught my interest. And when Dean Wilmot invited me to participate in an advisory committee, I heard a presentation by the current director of the vaccine development program, Dr. Hoff, that blew my mind. He was studying mechanisms of cellular and humoral immunity in addition to the efficacy of vaccines, and he had a clinical facility to study patients. Clearly, he had elevated the program to the next level to become a national leader in this field and, quite frankly, a jewel in the crown of SLU research. It's no surprise that he was named to the National Vaccine Advisory Committee in June. Our confidence in Dean Wilmot's vision and his sincere commitment to expand research encouraged Zoe and me to decide on a way to express our respect and gratitude to, to SLU Medicine. So in these dire times of the COVID-19 pandemic, the combination of Dr. Hoff's leadership and excellence in vaccine development in an internationally recognized program, coupled nicely with our responsibility for COVID-19 testing, high throughput COVID-19 testing for a growing 14 hospital health system. This stimulated us to contribute to this institute immediately because the time is right to fight the COVID plague on our society and investigators at SLU can play a major role. As Steve said, we are very much honored today to be part of the SLU Vaccine Center. As a clinical scientist, and the scientific director for the Molecular and Genomic Pathology Laboratory at the Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. I have been overseeing the COVID PCR testing performed in my laboratory, and we have tested over 115,000 specimens since March. The total financial burden of these testing on the healthcare system and the tremendous effort and the sacrifice from my team members made me personally aware how important the vaccine is in this pandemic war. I want to congratulate SLU's Vaccine Center to be at the front and center in the war of um, in the work of COVID vaccine. On a personal note, Steve always attributes his abilities and the career achievement to two things, medical education in SLU and his hardworking habits. Both of us are grateful that we have the opportunity to contribute to SLU in some ways. When you are doing the right thing, you are in peace and happy. That is how we feel about our donation. Thank you very much.
Thanks to you both. Um, your gift has already proven transformative for vaccine research at SLU. So I'd like to now return to Dr. Hoff. Dr. Hoff, can you give an overview of the research that SLU's Center for Vaccine Development has done on possible treatments and vaccines for COVID-19? You're on mute again, Dr. Hoff. Sorry. Um, Certainly, but first I feel compelled to thank <laughs> Steve and Zoe again um, for such a kind, um, uh, humbling, uh, honoring um, uh, statement. I very much appreciate it and um, I will do everything in my power to try to keep you proud of what we're doing here. <laughs> um, for uh, an overview of what we are doing in COVID-19 uh, in the realm of both treatment and uh, vaccine development for COVID-19. Uh, I'll start with just introducing the ACT trials that have been funded through um, our connections through the VTEU uh, and linking us up with um, many sites around the world uh, looking at treatments uh, for um, hospitalized patients with um, uh, COVID-19. We are part of the ACT trial, uh, the uh, trial uh, which is an adaptive trial, meaning that as you learn more, you change and do new studies uh, to follow up on the original. This trial started off with no um, comparator, no standard of care for treatment of um, uh, COVID-19. And we started off uh, comparing remdesivir uh, versus placebo to make sure that we knew whether or not there would be a treatment that could work. Fortunately, that so-called ACT-1, which is comparing just remdesivir to placebo, did show that remdesivir is superior to placebo in at least uh, shortening by a third the uh, length of illness in patients uh, with moderate to severe disease. And now that has become available across the United States and, and the world through Gilead, the, the uh, producer uh, for treatment of patients. In Act II, uh, which has also been completed, the concept was to determine whether or not we could make something better than remdesivir as a treatment. And what was compared with remdesivir uh, was not placebo. We could get rid of that since we had something superior. So now we were looking at remdesivir alone or remdesivir uh, plus a drug called baricitinib, which has two uh, major uh, activities. One is that it can um, have um, uh, immunomodulatory, uh, anti-inflammatory type effect and is licensed uh, for rheumatoid arthritis. And in addition, it appears to block, at least in vitro, some of the enzymes required by the SARS-CoV-2 virus to um, uh, replicate inside human cells. So the concept was potentially that we could add something that might block the, uh, the pro-inflammatory bad outcomes that happen in severe disease and also uh, provide a second drug for treatment of the virus. That also has been completed. I just saw for the first time this morning some of the data and there is at least some additional benefit, it appears, in some subsets of patients that will be coming forward uh, for public uh, review soon. We've already pivoted to Act 3, which is um, now looking at uh, remdesivir alone versus remdesivir plus uh, a type 1 interferon to directly act on the virus. Now, too early to know about this, but um, Sarah George in our group, Dr. Sarah George, has been our site PI for the ACT trial and has been doing a fabulous job supporting that. Secondly, uh, we have been involved in treatment through uh, convalescent plasma. This is uh, collecting uh, plasma from patients who had COVID-19 and then recover. 
and the concept has been around for a long time that we can take uh, serum plasma from people that are getting over an infection and use that to help other people. That has been uh, shown to be safe. We don't really have evidence yet of whether or not it helps significantly, um, but there are ongoing studies for that. And Dr. Sharon Fry in our group has been leading that effort. In trying to understand more about what the virus does to the human body and to the immune response and why some people, not most, but some people do progress to severe disease. It's very important to do studies that we call natural history studies, which means you um, identify people with an infection and then you follow them and take blood samples and other types of samples to understand what the virus is doing and what the immune response is doing. This is a trial that hasn't started yet that I'm one of the protocol co-chairs for that's being funded by the VTEU and we hope to start in December. With this trial, we hope that we will be able to understand and maybe predict who are those individuals that may go on to have the more severe forms of disease so we can pay more attention to them and make sure that we're following them more closely and hopefully develop preventative treatments for that. Um, the last area that I'll discuss is our work in vaccine uh, development for COVID-19. We're working with a large network uh, called the CoVPN uh, or the Coronavirus uh, Vaccine Prevention and Prevention Network. This includes all 10 of the vaccine and treatment evaluation Asian units that were one of the 10, as well as most of the HIV uh, treatment, prevention, and vaccine development networks. All of the uh, clinical translational um, uh, awards that are given out by the uh, NIAID that uh, Dr. Fauci is, is the head of. Um, this brings about 50 sites together and additional private sites outside of this network are helping six companies that have developed COVID-19 vaccines do phase three trials. So far, and we have been uh, contributing to the first one, the Moderna uh, mRNA vaccine trial, and we've already enrolled over 400 subjects and across the 89 total sites involved in this trial, all in the United States, there's been about 26,000 uh, people enrolled in the intended target of 30,000 uh, volunteers. We will be vaccinating half of these subjects. We'll be following them for two years for both safety and for looking at long-term immunity um, to make sure that the vaccines can induce a long-term immune response. And we hope that within six months after the vaccinations, in interim analyses, we will be able to determine whether or not the Moderna vaccine was superior to placebo. Um, we don't know that yet. And, uh, that should happen, uh, the interim analysis, in the first quarter of 2021. And that would be the first chance for at least this vaccine that we would um, be able to potentially utilize it in the U.S. public and other places uh, throughout the world. There's five more lining up. Uh, second one started. There was a pause you know, because of an adverse event in uh, Europe. Uh, they dil diligently stopped the trial. We stopped ours as, or didn't start them yet, actually were about to and halted the start. Uh, and uh, the European groups have gone forward thinking that there was no reason not to after a detailed review of all the uh, outcomes in this uh, one case. The FDA and the US government, uh, the COVPN, are looking at it a second time with a second pair of eyes just to make sure that we don't feel 
that there's any uh, more uh, concern that should be put into this. But we anticipate that that trial will start very soon. Um, the next trial that we'll be participating in will be the uh, Janssen J&J sponsored adenovirus vaccine trial, uh, which is going to start very, very soon. Um, so we're very excited about these and being able to participate in these trials. We're also very excited about the potential for these vaccines to help the world. And we're very hopeful. Of course, we can't guarantee anything at this point. We have to do the studies. We have to do all of the safety evaluations and all of the uh, efficacy evaluations, which are ongoing. I'll end with just saying that my lab is also working on um, trying to develop what we're calling a universal pathogenic coronavirus vaccine, which theoretically could be ready for the next coronavirus outbreak. There's been three of these already over the last 20 years, and SARS-CoV-1 and MERS and SARS-CoV-2. They all started in bats. They went through lower mammals and then uh, got into humans. Because of that process of adapting to similar organisms um, in their march towards humans, that we, we would call a form of convergent uh, evolutionary selective pressure. And so it's going to happen again. It's happened three times. And it's likely that since we're already finding shared sequence between these three pathogenic uh, viruses, that we, uh, the next one would also share sequences with these. So at least that's our hope and our, uh, our work is um, not as far to phase three yet, but um, we are seeing that some of the predictions that we've made so far are uh, real T-cell epitopes, um, and uh, we are waiting for some more funding to be able to do <laughs> additional work. But at this point, um, it's looking promising and it's looking very possible. That's kind of a brief uh, overview of the key things that we're involved in with COVID-19 uh, treatment trials and uh, vaccine development, and I will um, turn the uh, virtual podium back to you, Dr. Redmond. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Hoff. I know one of the important things that you've been considering during these clinical trials is including those communities who have been most neg negatively affected by this pandemic, something that our next panelist is closely tracking. So I'd like to introduce now Dr. Enval Shockham, Professor of Public Health, Associate Director of the Geospatial Institute at St. Louis University. Dr. Shockham, can you speak to your efforts in tracking COVID-19 and what insights from that research are useful in developing and eventually distributing a vaccine? Hi there. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. I'd love to talk about the work we've been doing and hopefully how it will support the work at the new institute. Um, so some of the work we've been doing has really been focusing on locations as locations have been um, really anchoring where the infections of COVID um, have occurred and how they continue to grow. Um, and so we've really been trying to use non-traditional public health sources or other health sources that um, can give us a sense of where and how and um, when to expect uh, this early sensing technology or when to expect a new outbreak or hot increase in rates. Um, and so one of our ways that uh, leveraged non-traditional public health data was to be able to use anonymized smartphone data coupled with public health data to identify where essential employees had driven much of the inequity and infections in our communities. Basically where uh, stay-at-home policies were not being able to be adhered to among low-skilled yet essential employees at the start of the epidemic. These patterns of infection and underlying inequity persist ac across the country. So by using those data and being able to identify and couple it with other data sources, we were able to say, oh, these are, these are employees that are at highest risk and they're, not, they're hourly wage workers. They're working in healthcare support offices as well as food service um, and, and public transportation actually as well. So 
in addition to that, we, we also recently found that um, we're looking at how the effect, impact of mask ordinances that are occurring in certain locations. So our mask ordinances are happening at different levels in our government. So some states, some cities, and some counties are using these um, policies to reduce the infection rate of COVID. And so what we were able to identify that in St. Louis City and St. Louis County, they had put in the mask ordinances as of July 3rd. So we are just wrapping up 12 weeks of this uh, intervention. So what we found was that um, not only did the uh, daily infection growth rate of COVID reduce, but that policy also reduced infection um, inequity across race, population density, and income. And what that means is really that when you place a policy, put a policy in place, we were able to see that race and population density and the lower income, median income was no longer a predictor of whether people were getting infected with, with COVID. So we think that's a really big, important um, contribution to thinking about how we best deliver and disseminate vaccines. Lastly, we're starting to look at exactly how to parallel the work that's happening in the, the development of a vaccine and how are we going to get it to our public? How are we going to get it to the public good? Um, how do we best um, uh, locate where to concentrate our efforts and understand, better understand um, the barriers to vaccine uptake so that we are able to develop and deliver more uh, accurate as well as um, more, more important messages to particular aspects of the population. So thinking about what base understanding or increasing our understanding about the barriers to care and understanding how do we communicate how, to, how important a vaccine is and to take this vaccine or explain the safety as well. So we're going to be able to learn so much more about um, people's perceptions today and in the next month. Um, and so looking at, we're, we're hoping that we'll be ready to go once, once a a, an accurate and effective uh, vaccine is ready to go. Thanks to Dr. Haft. Thanks, Dr. Shockham. Thank you. Um, before we go to our next panelist, I wanted to remind the audience members that please feel free to post any questions that you might have on the questions tool in Zoom. So one takeaway that we learned from Dr. Shockham's research is that, or from the tracking data in general, has been that there are certain communities across the U.S. that have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So this, to discuss disparities such as this, I'd like to welcome our third panelist, Dr. Daniel Blash, Vice Dean of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and Chief Diversity Officer for the SLU School of Medicine. So Dr. Blash, can you give us some insight into what you're seeing in your work with local communities what disparities are being created or worsened during COVID-19? And how should this knowledge affect the development and distribution of a vaccine? Uh, absolutely, and let me um, greet everyone and echo all of the kind things that have already been said. Um, and I'm especially um, happy to be participating in this conversation as it's very clear through the data that there has been a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 and, and the subsequent fallouts from COVID-19 within black and brown communities um, across the United States. Um, the CDC put out a report in uh, August noting that um, in terms of cases uh, within the black community, uh, cases or incidences of an infection was about 2.6% higher than the white community. And in terms of the Hispanic population, a little higher than that, even 2.8%. Um, the numbers change a little bit in terms of hospitalization within the black community, 4.7% higher, within the Hispanic community, 4.6% higher. And then in terms of deaths within the black uh, community, uh, community 2.1% higher, and within the Hispanic population, 1.1% higher. Um, so obviously these are, these are quite alarming disparities and uh, there's been lots of conversation in the media and of course locally about what this means for us and how do we think about um, treatment, how do we think about interacting with our community, what's the feel out there. Um, so Terry, right now I would say, you know, we're, we're, we're still working with the backdrop of a lot of distrust between the black and brown community and the medical community, and in particular, the research community. 
um, in recent conversations with a friend uh, who is a physician um, in town um, and a diversity um, hero, he said, Daniel, I was at a meeting and at the meeting I talked to a lot of uh, minorities and he said, not one person said, I want the vaccine. Um, as a matter of fact, he described a lot of fear, anxiety, and just a lack of awareness. One of the things that I think is unique is where information comes from and how we hear it. Information that comes directly from the United States government sometimes isn't trusted, although it very well could be the best information. Um, as we get to a more local scenario, I do think SLU has a very credible voice within the St. Louis community. And I think the voices that come out of uh, this effort will, will be heard uh, in a way that's uh, more receptive and, opening and open. Um, so in terms of my insight and, and working in the community, I also would echo that I sense a lot of anxiety, a lot of concern. Um, and as I'm talking to leaders, clergy, and other people that I, I call these the people that sort of own the airwaves into the black and brown community. As I'm talking to those leaders, uh, they too have questions that they want to be answered by the medical community. And I think that's a key. I think it's people like me, it's people uh, collaborating with um, you all, um, Dr. Hoff, others. I think it's us coming together and having sincere conversations in our community to do a few things. One, um, really take ownership or at least acknowledge that there has been a rocky pass between us. I think to not acknowledge that is a non-starter. Um, but then once we're able to talk about that and to really talk about some of the safety and some of the inclusion mechanisms that have been now in, in place for many, many years, um, I think that's probably the beginning conversation. So a message that's very sensitive, that's very timely, that's very honest, um, and that's a two-way street, I think is definitely needed right now in our communities. Um, I have to tell you that I'm concerned, as was my physician friend, uh, his comment to me was, Daniel, a lot of people are going to die in our communities if they don't understand and then participate um, in this vaccine, and not just receiving it, but also the, the research part of it. Being involved in the trials is critical. So uh, we're working very hard, but um, Terry, it's been a very uh, difficult road because we've got a lot of repair work to do along the way. Um, but I think that we have clergy and other leaders that are ready to listen and discuss and will help us contribute um, a strong message to the black and brown community. In a recent conversation with um, Dr. Fry, I said to her, I said, Sharon, what you need is a long line of clergy um, standing there saying, I'll, I'll take the vaccine. Uh, we need people to build the bridge between that black and brown community and the medical community. Um, and, and hopefully there's an ongoing relationship that's developed there so that all this good work can uh, apply to all the people that really need to benefit from it. Um, so again, Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of this conversation. Um, and I'm very, very thankful for the collaboration that we have uh, at this point. Looking forward to more of it in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Blash. Your comments raised some questions about how we can operationalize these really important concepts that, that you've brought for us. And here to talk more about that policy piece is our fourth panelist, Dr. Anna Santos Rutschman. Assistant Professor of Health Law. So Dr. Rutschman, how can we translate all of the knowledge that's been shared here today into effective and equitable policy and practice? How can that help us think about who should get a vaccine first once we have one? Well, first, 
thank you for allowing me to be a part um, of the event today and more broadly thank you for um, the support for the Institute which uh, as many speakers have now uh, referenced will further help us uh, work outside the um, not traditional but the old silo mentality in which people like me at the law school would be a 10 minute drive away uh, from the main campus and from the medical campus um, so this is a terrific um, opportunity to continue um, SLU's tradition of interdisciplinary work. And today I think I represent um, the five full-time professors at um, the law school who are part of the largest um, health law and policy center in um, the country and hence in, in, in the world. Um, and I, I think I speak for all of them in saying that our most uh, immediate contribution is enabled by all the other strands of work that are currently taking place um, at SLU. So we're monitoring the clinical trials um, process. We're monitoring uh, what's um, happening in terms of the data that's being gathered um, for FDA approval uh, of emerging vaccines, um, treatments, uh, and other medical technologies that uh, are needed in the response to COVID, but also in the prevention of um, future outbreaks of infectious um, diseases. We are talking to the local um, community to understand um, things like misinformation, disinformation, but also hesitancy um, due to lack of information, which is a situation we're currently um, all um, you know, sharing a piece uh, of. So we are working locally to understand what is happening. Uh, we are working regionally, understanding what is happening in the Midwest beyond um, the vaccine regulatory level, how people uh, are being um, informed or kept abreast of what's happening in terms of the development of de these very um, fresh um, technologies. And then we're also working nationally. So all of us at the law school are part of some advisory committee or body right now. The moment that the National um, Academy of Sciences re released on September 1st, the tentative guidelines for um, vaccine, um, COVID vaccine um, allocation, we all first sat down to read the 100 pages of that report, but we've also contributed um, commentary um, and advice um, at the national level. And it's really enabled by being embedded in this large, uh, larger scholarly um, community and in our community. And just um, as a quick last note, I would uh, add that some of the things we are concerned about, uh, and again, this echoes um, concerns um, expressed by other panelists, have to do with an underrepresentation of um, racial and other minorities in some of the decision-making processes and some um, of the ongoing um, tests, again, not just locally, but really um, nationally, and with misinformation or lack uh, of information, even for those um, seeking accurate um, sources. Um, and so we'll keep working uh, within SLU and uh, be on SLU um, to make better uh, or more science-informed based policy in the near future and hopefully in the post-pandemic as well. Thank you, Dr. Rutschman. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists. And now we want to hear from you in the audience. So what questions do you have for any or all of the panelists? And you just enter those into the questions box at the bottom of Zoom. And I will start with um, one of the first questions, which is um, there was a new poll released on Tuesday that showed that only 13% of Americans that were polled would be willing to try a COVID-19 vaccine as soon as it was available. So what are the things that the panelists think that we should be looking for in a first generation vaccine once one is released to determine whether or not it's safe to take that vaccine? Was that directed at a, me? <laughs> um, Anyone can answer that question. Well, I'll start. Um, so uh, what, what we are doing to try to dispel the concerns with, with safety is making sure that we follow the um, detailed uh, phase one through phase three um, analysis of vaccines, meaning you start in a small group of people, you then in phase one, and then in phase two, you go a little bit hot, larger numbers. And we're talking maybe uh, 40 to 50 in the phase one, uh, and a few hundred in phase two, up actually in, in the COVID trials up to 600. And then during the uh, phase three, which is where you're really testing for rare uh, safety events, as well as efficacy to know whether or not the vaccine works. I already mentioned 
that uh, each of these phase three trials will enroll at least 30,000 volunteers. Uh, that's a huge number for uh, a phase three trial. And so we're actually enrolling that many, again, for two reasons. One is for safety. When you have a large number, you can see the rare events more uh, likely uh, in a shorter period of time. Um, and of course, the other reason is to try to have uh, enough of the infections happen among the total population to be able to say whether or not the vaccine significantly protected compared to placebo. So um, we're following the standard phase one through phase three uh, uh, trial testing uh, methods. They're a little bit different. Uh, they are um, moving faster for an obvious reason. We're trying to get a vaccine ready for the world or multiple vaccines ready for the world as fast as we can. But we will be following all of these subjects for two years to make sure there's no delayed um, problems. I um, can tell you that for the Moderna vaccine uh, that we're testing right now, there is um, some reactogenicity, we call it, when uh, you talk about uh, some side effects of a vaccine. Uh, the most common uh, side effect, and you all know this, uh, when you get a shot is that you have pain at the site or the needle went into your arm or elsewhere. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we're seeing uh, that with the Moderna vaccine, it's been tolerable. The highest dose in the phase one uh, did cause what would be graded as more than tolerable or less than to uh, higher levels of reactogenicity than tolerable. Um, so we backed down for the phase three for a dose that didn't, wasn't associated with those types of responses. Um, so safe, the, another piece of uh, evidence for safety is having uh, independent data, data safety monitoring boards, or DSMBs. These are groups of people that are knowledgeable in the field, but have nothing to do with the trials, except that they're set up as an independent objective group uh, to evaluate um, the, what's happening in the trial and look at all the safety data, most importantly, but in, in phase three, they'll also be looking at the efficacy. Uh, so they are there to make sure that nobody with the passion that wants to, uh, these to work, but we have to do the science, um, that nobody goes beyond uh, the science. Um, and I'll stop there and let other panelists uh, add. Uh, Add to that or we can move on to another question. <laughs> if I could jump in just very quickly, you know, as somebody who's not a scientist, I'm always amazed at the speed um, at which not just these vaccines, but things we need for public health crises are often um, developed. From the legal side of things and in particular from the regulatory perspective, this is not really different from what we've done a million times before. There's basically two laws that apply here. One tells the FDA how to approve um, health products in general, and the other regulates biologics, which is what vaccines uh, fit under. And in many, many cases, whether there's a pandemic or a public uh, health crisis, or it's just business as usual, there are ways to expedite the review of these, um, of these products. So this is actually a, a standard system that we have in place when we need to fast track um, things a little bit for public health um, reasons. So from that regulatory perspective, we're very comfortable with the system we um, have in place as long as it's backed by data. And, um, and, and that's why the rest of um, SLU and all the scientists uh, on this call exist and, and work towards that. I would, I would just add one more comment to that, if I could. Um, the idea of everything we've actually discussed to this moment is, is exactly how, how important it is to communicate these important findings and how do we can um, convince when we all feel that there's a safe and effective um, 
a safe and effective vaccine, we will be able to do that. And, and as long as these, these, these standard protocols are followed, us as scientists can translate that to community members and, and we just need to do really much better. As Dr. Bush highlighted, we have a long history of not doing well, so let's do this work now. Thanks to everyone for that. Um, a question from the audience. Will COVID-19 eventually disappear on its own? And if so, how might that happen? And how long might that take? I guess I'll start off. Um, it's very, very unlikely that COVID-19 is just going to disappear on its own. At this point, it's gone all around the world, and it's the worst pandemic that we've experienced in 100 years. Um, so we absolutely need to develop countermeasures, uh, meaning treatments, mm, vaccines and that we can uh, deliver to all people um, as needed. And uh, so I, I don't think there's um, uh, any likelihood, if we're going in the wrong direction right now, we just surpassed 200,000 deaths in the United States. Um, uh, so we, we need to all work together uh, to have consistent message and consistent practices to try to pre uh, prevent the spread that's happening now uh, before uh, the vaccines can induce enough immunity in enough people that it could provide what we term herd immunity or immunity that um, is capable of, because it's uh, present in a majority of people, that it could protect the people that had got vaccinated had gotten vaccinated as well as others. Uh, that is very unlikely to happen in a rapid period of time just from infection. As right now, the rates of infection in most places in the United States are well less than 5%. So most people are still susceptible and we need at least, it's estimated 60 to 70% of the people to have been infected, uh, if they can develop an immune response after infection, to uh, actually um, have that herd immunity effect. Um, but that would take a lo uh, significantly longer period of time and be associated with, um, in my mind, an intolerable number of additional deaths. The next question um, from an audience member. I've heard others talk about the importance of vitamin C, vitamin D, zinc, and antioxidants when fighting COVID-19. So what are the panel members' thoughts on, on the effectiveness of those options? Dr. Hoff, you're on mute. Somebody else muted me <laughs> that time. Um, I was just saying, does somebody else want to start? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I think there's a lot of potential treatments, um, but we have to do the science. We have to know if they work. Um, and right now, those the list that you just read off um, includes things that we just don't know about. Um, it's never a bad idea to have good nutrition to make sure that you get plenty of vitamins and elements and so on. And so that's certainly important to do. Um, but uh, uh, unless we do trials of uh, treatments or, pro or preventative treatments, uh, which some of those things could potentially be useful for, uh, we don't know. So at this point, um, we need to do the trials and there, there hasn't been as much information supporting the potential benefit of those potential treatments as the other ones that we've discussed. Thank you. 
So some nations and states are partnering with major tech companies like Apple and Google to enhance their contact tracing. Should large tech companies like this be involved in collecting information, or should this be left to medical professionals or regional public health experts? Yeah. Dr. Shockham, perhaps you would like to take this question? Sure, I'd love to. Um, so we just had a discussion about this. We've collected some data about people's perceptions of, and their comfort level on a nationally representative sample that looks at just that, who should collect these data and who should share these data and how comfortable should we be with an app that says, hey, if, you have, if you're exposed to somebody and do contact tracing in that way, can we do this efficient ad addition or complement to the public health work that's already being done? So as a public health professional and somebody who wants you to do this, I say, yes, trust it. The other part is absolutely challenging. Uh, I think it's really hard to, to decide who to trust with which data um, and who gets to have access to those data of yours. We carry around smartphones and they are, uh, they are taking and collecting all sorts of data about us all the time. So who gets to own those data, who gets to share those data are challenging building the public health infrastructure that can actually do this so our local public health professionals can, can serve in this capacity is um, a wonderful piece. I would also offer that Google and Apple already have all your data, so maybe having them do it in this way is not so bad. It's a really challenging conundrum, and um, it's, an, it's the ethical, one of our ethical challenges today. Thank you. Next question, um, and I think I think any of you or all of you could answer this question or at least offer your opinion on this one. Do you think that schools and places of work should require COVID-19 vaccinations once they become widely available? And I know that there are, this is a very complex question, um, and there are multiple um, perspectives. I'll go first. Um, so yes, it's a very complicated question and we don't know enough yet. Um, and just like we're doing uh, trials in adults currently uh, for looking at safety, immunogenicity, efficacy, we need to do the same types of at least bridging studies into the pediatric population. So the uh, COVID-PM that I mentioned that we're part of is trying to plan to do some of these bridging studies in pediatric patients, um, but uh, they're not off the ground yet. So it's possible that there could be different safety issues in uh, children when you give the vaccines, or they just not, might not work the same because the immune system hasn't fully matured or hasn't had as much in the way of different exposures. Um, so uh, I think it's premature to try to answer that question. If we had a safe um, and um, a vaccine that looked like it would be effective, we wouldn't do 30,000 kids in a trial like we're doing in the adult trials, but we would do mostly for safety and immunogenicity in kids to bridge down into them. Uh, if, if we have the data that demonstrates that they uh, are safe in younger populations and effective. Um, uh, it further depends, I think, on knowledge also that we don't know, and that is how important are uh, children in the amplification of the spread of the infection. We know that kids certainly can get infected. They don't seem to have and most of the time, uh, severe disease or uh, less likelihood. Uh, but um, we, we need to do more studies for all the things I just mentioned, and I'll let others speak. Um, I would say from a um, just kind of cultural and where we are in our nation at this point, there would be tremendous pushback from minority communities uh, where you have the adults that are very concerned 
um, for themselves taking a vaccine. Um, I would imagine when it comes to their children uh, being forced, it, it would be a big deal. And uh, there have been conversations that um, sound kind of like this. Well, we already mandate certain vaccines uh, for school anyway. What if we added this to it? Um, and that's true. We do. We do mandate that there's a certain uh, vaccination point. I think this would be something that would be unique and special and probably would require a lot of communication within some of those populations that are reluctant to um, uptake this vaccine. And just to add to that, on the legal side of things, it would really depend, you know, assuming it would be, um, you know, scientifically indicated um, to vaccinate um, uh, childhood populations, it would depend on how we would go about doing it. So we know that states can mandate um, vaccination. Um, that's been very uncontroversial for over 100 years right now. Um, but it can't be just a couple of schools deciding um, to do that. So we would worry about some, um, some disparities and who the decider here uh, would be. Is it the state? Is it a particular school system? Is it a private school? Is it a public school? So th there's a lot of unanswered legal questions, but I'll just uh, add to that, that most health law um, scholars uh, right now, if you take the temperature of the field, they don't really think there should be uh, a mandate. Um, actually, they don't think sh there should be a mandate period, but specifically not a childhood uh, mandate at, the, at this um, point for the reasons uh, mentioned by Dr. Blash and for concerns with hesitancy in general. I think the flip side of all of that is very absolutely challenging. And I think the other flip side of that is that um, what we know about when policy regulates behavior, it actually changes behavior more efficiently um, than not having a policy. So we're really going to rely on so much science and so much um, learning in the, next, in the next couple months as well as years that really translate into how do we best do this to support the humans and human flourishing that we care about, so deeply about. Thanks to all of our panelists. And unfortunately, um, the time for our webinar has come to an end. So I wanna thank our panelists for spending their time and sharing their expertise with us today and all of you in the audience for participating. There will be a recording of this webinar available on the slu.edu backslash research website and on Twitter if you follow SLU Research. And we will be answering questions or um, posting answers to the questions that were provided through the Q&A. So thank you all once again for attending.